of like The Road to El Dorado, Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron, Sinbad, Legend of the Seven Seas, Balto, Prince of Egypt, Shark Tale, Madagascar, Corpse Bride, Kung Fu Panda, The, the Pirates, Band of Misfits, I should say, Hotel Transylvania, and I actually left out a ton of credits because we want to get to the interview. So without further ado, please welcome Carlos Grangel. Holy smokes, how are you doing, my friend? Uh, doing well, thank you, Bobby, for this wonderful introduction that I don't think I deserve, but uh, thank you so much. You know, I feel like I've interviewed enough of the top artists to know that that is also a trait of many of the top artists where they're like, me? No, no, those guys, that person, this person, they helped us out. That's why the movie looks so great. And of course, if you asked any of those other people, they would say, no, it's Carlos, oh my goodness, his work, that, that's what saved the movie, you know, things like that. <laughs> so They must be joking, but I will name a few today too, so. Perfect, so yeah, I'm, perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure which artists were, so, so anyway. Perfect. So well, it's been, uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the long time. I just wanted to find the best moment, quiet moment, that we can talk quietly. And uh, this is it. So it was today. Sorry. No, no need to apologize. You know, sometimes when, when they are harder to get, then it's like I just want it even more. <laughs> so this has been great. Um, we have some similarities. Uh, that I want to tell you about. Uh, one is that we both have studios that are not in America. Uh, my studio has been around for 15 years. I believe your studio has been around for over 30 years. Um, and both of us have a brother kind of in the shadows that's been doing so much for us, uh, it, for the studio, for the company and everything. My brother Ben has been nothing but amazing throughout these years, um, and the studio would not exist without it. I would love to kind of hear about your brother and your relationship. What does he do uh, for the studio? That, that, is, that, is, that is pretty amazing, but because I, I think uh, the same about Jordi, which is five years younger. And he's been running the studio when I am in and out, and he's the boss. He he always goes before sending the stuff and saying this is not good enough, <laughs> so take it out. And uh, Jordi Jordi is an artist and actually an entrepreneur as well, and he knows better than I how to how to put together a good team of fellas that they can do the job. And it's true without him. Grangela Studio will not exist because uh, many times I've been living in, in, in for long in, in LA or in London or going to Munich in Germany or doing other jobs around the planet. And, and Jordi is the one that kept the studio with everyone working and, and doing other jobs and helping me on, on many of them. And... That's that's pretty that's pretty amazing that you pointed that, uh, Bobby. Because uh, yeah, my brother, I couldn't get a better person to run the studio. You know, it's special and, uh, because he, you you know you can trust the person with your life pretty much. It, it is true, and at the same time, I am so lucky because he's he's a good artist, he's a good sculptor, he's he's a good draftman, he controls computers, Photoshop, and and works with modelers and sculptures from um, movies from puppeteers to modelers in CGI. And, uh, and, uh, and he's very good at the three techniques in animation, 2D, 3D, and stop motion. So, so he's a good, he's a, he's, he's a I, I believe, and it's not by saying it, it's, it's a better artist than, than myself. It's more complete. I focus more on, on character design or doing a piece in color, you know, background and characters. But but he is the guy that that knows more techniques. Um, he's more skilled than I in many fields. So, wow, that's high praise. Um, how does it work with the artwork versus the the business side of things? Because we can't just be drawing and painting when you have a bunch of employees, you have meetings to attend, things like that. Is that what Jordy ends up doing it, most of it? Or? Yeah, 
yeah, he had, he sacrificed fifty percent of his artistic career, you know, and and he sacrificed for the studio and the team. Yeah, he's the guy that that is calling people and going into the meetings, preparing a schedule with an assistant, and 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 doing the dirty job for me to look well and nice and pretty in front of the big studios, you know. So so yeah, yeah, that's, that's it. That's another thing we have in common. That's why I just, I love my brother so much because also he's a writer, but he had to put that down, you know, write on his own time, write personal, for his own personal interest because he needs to run the studio, you know, and he, because of that, it allowed me to shine, right? Yeah. And so that, I feel like that, that has a very big similarity to you and how you must feel about your brother. Yeah, it's a special gift that uh, he's giving it away on, on many credits, even on, on many things, because, you know, sometimes the studio, they don't recognize many people behind, just more when you have a studio that, that produces work overseas. You know what I'm saying? So, yes. so to, be, to be that kind of person, uh, uh, to, to be honest, he's, he's, he's really, he's giving it away very easy and... and he doesn't mind about all these um, Hollywood life and, <laughs> and prizes or awards. I, I, I actually don't care much, but, but he's even much less, much less. It's more even humble than, than, than myself, you know. We, yeah, I my can't. brother, he doesn't care about any accolades for himself. <laughs> but if he feels like I'm missing one, he gets upset. You know, he's like, no, you deserve this credit or whatever. Like, it's very protective. But he's That's an older brother. You mention it because he, he does it as well. You know, he does it as well. But, you know, uh, this is a strange business. Sometimes it's cruel. Sometimes people that had done so much on movies, they don't have recognition. And sometimes people that, you know what I mean, because uh, you've been in the industry. And, you know, at the end of the day, you have to be happy with what you do. Yeah. You have to be honest with with you with the paper, with the screen, with whatever you do, building a sculpture, whatever. You have to put your one hundred percent. I mean, I mean one thousand percent. And then you sleep well in your pillow and you don't cry. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of yeah. you, you, you put your best there, and and you're as good as your last piece. You know, so this it's is it. it's a very weird, interesting job that you know, that we kind of share um, in the way where when you're on the job, you should care about it. You should love this project because that's when the best stuff comes out, when you're so passionate about it. But when you're done that thing and you hand it in, you need to have almost like no attachment anymore. Hear that response, hear those revisions and kill those babies if we have to, to make new ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's correct. It's painful, but it's the way it goes, and it's a it's a team effort. So it's going to be coming the best we can, but from many people, not only one. You know. So here's a bit of a tougher question that I don't I I struggle with. You know, right now we're looking at uh, amazing, beautiful design that you did for Tim Burton. Um, when you have good ideas, when you feel like the idea is good. But your production designer, your art director, your your director doesn't agree yet. How do you how do you kind of fight for your ideas? Know when to fight for your ideas. I am a fighter. I've been a fighter since I started in the business, and I defend my characters highly and hard. You know, but at the end of the day, I learn that this is a work for hire and is a film that someone had a, a vision and someone had a script and the studio has a vision and has a target and there are many interests. So finally, I do what I think is best for the movie. That's why I've been able to change and move around my style, trying every movie, depending the mood and the tone in its style. So, so I try to do the best for the movie, for the script. I, I try to to get the best characters for that script, basically. I, I, I'm not a policeman that I'm trying to please all these people. 
I am hearing and I am taking notes, mainly director, directors, producers, and, and my artists, my colleagues working there. But at the end of the day, I think on the story, I think I have to create those characters as best as I can for that story, not for Carlos Grangel of his studio. You know, um, it's also very interesting because both of our studios are service type studios where we work for the bigger studios to help them create their vision most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so not sticking to one style is almost a necessity because even though Corpse Bride did amazing, Spielberg is not going to want something that looks like Corpse Bride. Correct. Right, and that's actually why the like my studio the the logo is of a chameleon, right? Mm -hmm. Because it could change styles. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, mm -hmm. we have to. Exactly, have to. exactly. And so, um, in order to do that, I'm always looking for new knowledge, things like that. So, I want to ask you when you think back to your earliest um, true big inspirations, the, the artistic inspirations where you were just mesmerized, you had to copy them over and over again, things like that. Can you name a few of those artists? Yeah, I started at the 80s uh, uh, looking at comic strips, Spanish artists and, and French Franco-Belgium artists, you know, the comic strips uh, like Uders on Asterix or Frank, Frank Ken on, on, on Lagaffe or Espiro and many, many artists here in Spain that they're not really well known, but they were fantastic. Uh, many, uh, I can name 40 on comic strips, you know, from painters to comic strip only doing, but doing their own styles and their own characters. And I must say that I never copy an artist on just trying to reproduce his drawings, I was kind of uh, inspired and, and do my take, but something totally different, that he could go in that style, but totally different from it. And that those guys, they inspire me a lot. But then they came the great names from America, like, like Frazetta, from Frazetta and uh, Will Eisner, um, um, many, 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 many great uh, illustrators that I discovered in my early years, you know, before I started in animation. And I was mesmerized about all the, all the influence that America had, mostly the United States artists, on, on, on my work, you know. Uh, I used to love, really love uh, comic strips from, from the Spider-Mans and Supermans, and then going more in, into, into Pogo, style, you know, Walt Kelly, you know, and and a little by little I detached from the superheroes going more intimacy, more into the the little cartooners, you know, and obviously the great names, uh, Frost, Sullivan, uh, all these people from England, Arthur Rackham and Edmund Dulac, uh, very early in the century, you know, but I collect them and, and, and I started more and more into into really artists that I thought, oh my God, what they are doing these guys. I, but I never thought I could do something similar, but, but those are where my influences. And obviously my, my first job in England at Amblimation and, and knowing all these amazing artists that they were there, that was my first opportunity to work on a feature film. And I was mesmerized about the, all, the, all the French I met there Nicola Marley, which I worked many years, and I'm still one of my best friends. Uh, Christophe Serran, uh, Rolf Genoden, and all the Spanish too, and German artists. And Uli Meyer was there too. Heinz Becker was there, and, and many, many more. And and uh, I think Andreas uh, or Andreas uh, Blasic was doing layouts back then, no? Yeah, Andreas Blasic, uh, like I met him in, in Munich. No, 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 he was doing, uh, he was a layout artist, but, yeah. but Andrea, Andrea Blasic always is very, never comfortable with what he does, so he was jumping from departments. Andre, uh, Andrea Blasic even worked on, on, on the Prince of Egypt, I think, doing, doing layouts too, you know, and, and he came from Europe too, one of the Europeans, so, so yeah, and then... Um, I remember Andrea had a great talent in sculpting, and we started doing 
the scopes for a spirit, you know. But uh, at that time, the studio called Ken Melton, uh, which was great, and he came already had done the Eldorado and Prince of Egypt ones, you know. So with with Raffaello too on 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 Prince of Egypt, if I remember. So, but Andre Andrea Blas, it's uh, I think. He can paint, he can sculpt, he can do layouts, storyboards, he can do his comic strips, so he everything. does everything well, too. He's a very complete artist. Now, you know, there is a part, I feel, that is missing from this story, um, because your studio is over, you know, it's over 30 years old. Um, yeah. It's 55. always been based in... Barcelona, Spain, yeah remote working was not popular. It was not a thing that people even trusted, you know, um, even when I started. Uh, and when I started, there was at least the internet. Yeah. What was that yeah. like, remote working? Like, did you think, first of all, did you think this is probably not going to work to work on, you know, uh, DreamWorks movies, some of the biggest DreamWorks movies and all this stuff. How did that work? Did you have to do a lot of trips there or something? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But that was uh, another blessing. Having my brother here, I could really take a plane and fly there or live in L.A. for two years, as I did on Prince of Egypt. And the thing is that we won a war for, for many clients that they offer us with possibilities. So when the big studios came and knocked at the door, he said, we're going to make, we're going to do as much as we can from our side. So the studio is going to keep running. And uh, if you if you need Carlos over there, Carlos is going to be over there. So that's not, not a problem. After finishing on Prince of Egypt and starting on in El Dorado, we, I felt just like L.A. wasn't for me. It's a great city and I love it and I will keep going there. But it wasn't for me to live always there. So I felt like coming back and and Dreamworks throw out a very nice party for me with Katzenberg and all the all the people and the artists. Thank you, Carlos, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't come with, with a job. I just was coming back home to keep on working on other things that Jordi and, and the team were, were working for other small companies. But after a month, they called back and they said, OK, keep on going and we, we will really like you to. To, to work on the next one, speed Madagascar, etc. And if you don't mind, if you can come over, check things, present things, and and be able to readdress things that they are they are not the way that we want to see them, um, that will be fantastic. And I've been doing all my life this this way. You know, I am putting my 100%. The studios are putting the 100%. And I have to be grateful to all the studios from Sony Pictures, of course, DreamWorks animation since Jeffrey Katzenberg built up that thing and Steven Spielberg and David Geffen and now with the Universal people, they always been really nice and 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 opening the door for me to to fly out of the cage where I am more exotic and I can do best. They realize that I can do I am more fresh in a way when I send the stuff from outside because I'm I'm producing where I want to live and and I have no problem on on a call on, on, on Friday and saying, hey, you should get your ass over here on Sunday in LAX, you know, and, and, <laughs> and wow. be on Monday at the studio. And I do it. If I can, I do it, you know. Wow. At the same time, Bobby, to me, sharing time with those amazing artists, what I saw in 1995 when DreamWorks started, I never saw it in my life. The amount of quality and... Imagine it starting with Carter Goodrich, Peter Desev, you have my friend Nicola Marley there, and hey guys, you are going to do the Prince of Egypt, you know. When I mention Carter Goodrich and Peter Desev, I mention the two top illustrators of America, of the contemporary time, yeah. that, that are the top ones. I'm sorry. There is no, the bar is so high. So... That blood, that American blood, mixed it with the European blood, with Nico and myself, and, and many other artists, of course. I'm just talking about character design. And to tell you the truth, that was really 
an amazing experience to start. And and unfortunately, I think DreamWorks did the best to to keep everyone and to use everyone, but did not use the the resource, the artistic resources they had at 100%. They tried. It's always difficult, depending directors, producers, bosses, etc. But but they had so many. Everything was so good that. Uh, it, it was a miracle that 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 Katzenberg or Spielberg will pick one of your designs because everything was amazing. So so, <laughs> but yeah, um, the thing is that we knew we had to to be flexible, and and we knew that was work for hire. They are hiring us, so we better move. And yes, we started working with the fax machine 30, 35 years ago. <laughs> there were no computers, no internet, you know. Yeah, and fax machine it was the only thing that was working. We still have one here and a number for the fax. That funny enough, we don't receive any now. And 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 yeah, because at the same time, the studio was doing comic strips for Disney publications and publishers. You know, uh, they were doing advertisement. They were doing breakfast commercials for London studios. They were creating characters for companies in, in, in Munich or, or doing shows and developing things for Japan, you know. So, so the studio was having that, was flourishing. And I was more working on, with other guys, of course, but I was more focusing on, on feature films, you know. Yeah. I actually, I never work in a TV series. I always focus on, on feature films, you know, because the thing is that when you have, you finish a movie and there is another company waiting for another one. You don't stop. It's kind of crazy. But this is it. In, in this business, the, the door is rather fully open or it's closed, you know? It, something else that people might feel is really crazy is um, not working on sequels because that seems like easy money. Can you yeah. explain a little bit about... Because I, I, I've definitely... I know where you're coming from, but I would love for you to explain uh, to the audience why you choose not to generally work on sequels. Um, being a designer, and I love the process of starting from zero or starting with some friends on a script with a director and a studio behind, no matter if it's a big studio or a small. I love the process of exploring, of creating a new path, of pushing boundaries and, and pushing the envelope and, and creating things. And to me, the sequels, it's just a few more characters, it's just a few more props. Style is created and it's like, hey, I did it, I explore it. Listen, life is too short as an artist to repeat yourself. So to me, it's more important, rather than doing a big fe- a sequel for for Sony as Otto Transylvania 25, you know, or, or DreamWorks, whatever, you know. Um, um, I get another project, less paid, but this, that will be unique and new and, and, and probably will not have that much exposure, but it will make me happy working. That's my goal. That's my idea. I understand that. Does your did your brother understand that from the beginning? <laughs> yeah, we both. Yeah, we are very passionate about what we do, and it's not that we fight, but we put passion and and, and stamina and energy in all what we do. And we need to create things from zero, or we need to share things with Tim Burton and and share things with, with, with many creative directors and artists, with, 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 with my fellow artists that, that working all day here or in the States or wherever they are. But we need to create new things. It's, it's as important as, as reading, you know. It's, it's sad to say to the studio, listen, guy, I'm not doing sequels. What? Okay, put a number. We're going to pay... Hey, that sequel, that, that movie made so much money. It's a franchise. You created some of those guys. Could you please? No. I'm not doing sequels. Yeah. Do you have anything original for me? It's really sad because I had two times the opportunity to work for Pixar. 
once when they call me for Ratatouille with the earlier director, Jan Pinkawa, uh, and, and I was engaged on another studio, on another project. And of course, two huge projects competing like Disney DreamWorks. It's, it's really strange to work on doing that. So I said, no, guys, I'm sorry. I'm finishing in four, five months. If you want to wait, they couldn't wait, obviously. But then I've been called twice more, and it was to work on a Monster University, the sequel, and, and then on, on Cars 2. And I'm sorry, it was Pixar, and, uh, but I have to let them know. And they were very nice. They invited me there, and I went up there in San Francisco, and it was, they treated me very well, but they said, Oh, God, you brought me... They didn't tell me which project was. And when I was there, they told me about the two sequels. Okay, you want to do Cars 2 or Monsters University 2? <laughs> and I said, I'm so sorry, guys. You brought me here to offer me a sequel? I don't even work on my own sequels I created before, you know? I don't do sequels. And I think they didn't took it well, but I slept well that night at the hotel, you know, and my brother, too came back and uh, and unfortunately I haven't done anything for them but but this is life I mean you have a compromise you take it and you go with it you know you stick to your guns yeah uh, you see if you have a brain if it's ringing a bell like saying you I'm not gonna enjoy doing that I better don't do it I explain it with respect because uh, clients they deserve all the respect because they are thinking on you they make a decision before calling. They made a meeting and they, many creative people said, we want to get that guy and they're there calling and you say no and, and you have to, you know, you, you, it's not only no, you have to build a story and you have to tell them why no, you know? And, and it's, it's kind of, it's kind of, uh, it's hard, but, but if you say it with respect and you explain it well, as best as you can, even with my English, they will understand that and they respect you. They respect you. And, and, and I get nothing but respect by, by the studios and the artists out there, wherever I go. So, so that's good. It's the way I am. And I, I just need to enjoy what I do and, Every project we take it with we love and, and passion and, and this is it, you know, it's 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 a new start, it's a new beginning. And doing a second part of what we have done before, it will not be as fresh or funny or or I will be I need to be full time passionate about what I do. If that doesn't happen, I need to get in love with the project even before starting. Such. And that thing is like, oh, I had that experience before. If I work on, on a script that is based on the same characters, probably moving around, they were in Madagascar, but they go to Paris, and now they are going to Hong Kong, wherever. It's not going to be the same. Style is set. I work with, with that guy. I work with the other guy. We had fun on the, on the first one. It was an amazing experience. We were... Getting out from the comfort zone, that's the word. Getting out from the comfort zone, creating something. And now, are we going to go back to the comfort zone because we're cashing in more dollars? No way, McKay. It's, it's not going to happen. You were talking before about one of your best friends, Nico Marley, which he says hi, by the and way. Nico. I was just talking with yeah. him earlier. And um, I, he, he wasn't talking about this, but it reminded me of something. Where did the term the three amigos come from? Because you, Carter Goodrich, right, and Nico yeah. Marley yeah. have been called the three amigos before. Yeah, well, we've been uh, called the three amigos, the three mosqueteers, the, <laughs> the three whatever. I mean, it's a friendly thing that, that it came from early years at DreamWorks. And the fourth was Peter the Seb, but Pete always had his his life in New York City and, and his career as as an illustrator and, of course, character designer for animation. And never really moved to L.A. to work with us full-time there. And, yeah, we, are, we kept 
We kept very good friends, best bodies in the business probably, which I have many friends. But talking about character design and, and friends which I can share things and these are guys that I can go and say, listen guy, could you please give me an idea and, <laughs> and make it right? I have all these things that I want. I just want to put it on the trash, you know, and not show. And, and they will do it. These are guys that they will do it showing their stuff there. So it means they are going to be competing. Not a friendly, com friendly competition, you know, but these are my best friends. If they need anything from me as well, Carlos, could you check that out? And I will do it for them. And it's, it's not enough how much I learn it from them because I want to keep learning from them because uh, both to me are, are masters on what they do on their own way. Uh, Who are these good looking guys you, right there? You got that one, eh? <laughs> <laughs> there, there is the, obviously on the, on the left-hand side is Nico and, and Carlo Goodrich, both very good looking. Then it's me, the greasy Spanish Diego, Diego you know, and, and <laughs> sitting down. And, and there are my two big amigos, uh, you know, <laughs> and, yeah, those are the early years, Prince of Egypt, El Dorado, at, at DreamWorks, at Lakeside. Not even the Glendale campus was built yet. So, oh, wow. I have to say, I have to say that all those producers there, and ultimately the boss, Jeffrey Katzenberg, we were coming from working with Spielberg. So, the people from Amblimation, Spielberg kind of brought his people, and Katzenberg brought his people, and getting, getting. Those two guys there influenced so much uh, the Ringworks movies, you know, and still today. So, so it's. Uh, How old are me, you there, you think? And I was probably 20 something, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Six. Amazing. Yeah. What about this one? You were talking about Peter DeSev earlier. Yeah, uh, Peter Sam Michlap, the, the taller one up there, great production designer, great painter too. Nico with his French hat and and in front the good looking predator the chef, yeah. Yeah. And the good things about those those guys that, that you're showing, as many of my colleagues, they're not afraid to share. They're not afraid. Best guys in the business I met, they are not afraid. And they're humble, they're honest. Uh, they cry on their pillows every night because they want to do more and better. And same Carter or Nico, or Peter or Sam, anyone, Tony Siruna, David Crane, I work with many. They go and say, hey, you do it much better. And then I go and say, no, no, you do it better. And then they will go and, and, and they mean it. They oh, mean yeah. it. They, they, are always, they are always not good enough, you know. Well, that's how you started off the interview, Carlos. You were like, oh, me, no, no, no. All those other people that you interviewed... You know, like those are the people, and it's like yeah, no, that's so many from Mignola to the, all the other ones that you interview that they are incredible artists. So animation is just like the small brother of illustration and comic strips because they, on comic strip and illustration they are working alone. They have to do everything them, themselves, from staging to color to character design and to background. So, so I admire all these guys that. that I wanted to become a comic strip artist, and then I went into animation. I, I had fun. I, I am fulfilled that uh, I work in animation, but I admire the, the great illustrators and comic strip artists, you know, from Japan to the States to, the, to Europe, etc. You know. You know, another question I have is, what is your studio website? The what, sorry, the studio website. The studio website. It's, listen, this is something pretty incredible. I am announcing that in 10 days we will have our new website out there. Oh, amazing. <laughs> okay, because I was looking for it. So by the time this comes out, everybody, please check out the website. Yeah. What's the Bobby, website address? I did it for you. Listen, here is the thing. Our website was in flash so 10 years ago. It got obsolete. No one could see it. We don't have Instagram. I don't have Facebook or LinkedIn. I don't have anything. Not, not even WhatsApp. 
but right. people finds me and finds the studio. <laughs> the thing is that we've been busy, 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 and yeah, we kind of let it go, and, and we didn't pay attention to the website, and many people wrote, it's been writing us and saying, hey, your website is in flies, we cannot even see it, you know, could you please? So Jordi, a few months ago, said, hey, we have to do something about the website, you know. <laughs> it's fine, we have work, and we need the website running. You know, it's something important, don't you think so? And I said, oh yeah, for, of course, but you know, I, I, I was having a nice life either. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not an Instagram. I'm not an artist that is... All the work that is on the internet, I didn't put it there. Believe me. It comes from interviews like yours or from THU or all these interviews of the last 30 years or people who just took an image and put it there. So so I'm not the guy on, on making me wonderful and putting images out there just to, to that it makes me feel good no i was more caring about our clients the relation with our artists here and outside um and getting good good enough to do the job not on on the focus or the exposure of my work or the studio work but yes we need the we need the the web going and and it's it's gonna happen so that's for sure and and actually, this interview had a lot of things to to do about it. And I, and, and Jordi said, okay, as soon as you finish your interview with Bobby Chu, you, you're going to send him your website, and in 10 days, it's going to be there. Because it's already almost finished, at least in English, you know? so <laughs> Perfect, perfect. We'll put it in the details. It should be already in the details of this video, everybody. Yeah, it should be. It should be. So, so... I think it's going to be coming in maximum. I think it's at the end of next week, probably maximum ten days. But but it's going to happen. This is going to be probably my first interview with the with the website running new and and it's not going to be anything crazy. It's going to be the shows we work and some samples and other projects that got cancelled. This is a, actually a video game we're working and we got permission to get images on the website and send you images. So. So it's the first video game that we're working for a company, and it's very stylized. So, so. Wow! Is this still you still work all traditionally for the the line work or the? Yeah, this is traditionally. This is done with multiliner, with Copic multiliner um, zero five, with a really thin uh, blue line pencil line underneath, and and just. Uh, with the multi-liner, just uh, adding shadows and passes, you know, uh, getting darker in some areas. So Let me ask you about this one previous. These sure. look like they're drawn on boxes. That is... Yeah, these are, these are drawn on boxes and actually Special K and and, uh, and uh, Kellogg's stuff, majority Kellogg's, but uh, this is what people eat here at the studio, so we don't throw out the boxes because it's a great patina to to work on top. Uh -huh. And uh, we we open the boxes and then we work with this, uh, basically with markers and then Prismacolor or Carandash color pencils on top and then a bit of wash or watercolor, depending. We are mixing techniques. We don't think there is a perfect technique out there, so we like to mix a lot. And the great color, the patina, we pick which kind of boxes, because the people who produces these boxes for the big companies that sells breakfast cereal, sometimes they have what, one color that is more kind of warmer, and sometimes it's a cold gray, kind of more cold. We use the cold ones for the zombies on course right. They were much more appropriate for, for that style. And here on this medieval style, we were using the more warmer ones. That was Monty Python's idea that I was very lucky to meet them, uh, uh, Eric Ayo, and, and we work on this idea that right now it's kind of on the freezer, you know? But uh, those those ones, we, we, we took the warmer colors of those boxes because I think there is something great about physical materials, you know, cardboards, and we don't have to buy all the time expensive canson paper or 
or any vellum, special vellum paper or watercolor paper that from Fraviano in, in Italy. We, we need to really use things that they, they go to recycling, so we better use them. And, and the colors are important, the background colors, to start with something, with some patina outside, you know, in the background. That's fantastic. I love that. I love that. It, there is something about when people see that, like, uh, oh, here's my idea, and it feels like this is a piece of art. Like, this feels like that wonderful kind of like you're having fun. It fits the subject matter as well. You present it, and it feels like, wow, this is a piece of art that somebody did, rather than ideas, just yeah. ideas. Yeah, yeah, because we wanted to be Tyrus Wong and Mary Blair. And, and when you see that, <laughs> you see a piece of art or, or be Mill Call or, or Mar Davis, you know. So yeah. we love everything we can do with our hands. But responding to your question, yes, we pay attention to any minimum, minimal detail from the copyright to the name of the characters that is fully designed by hand over here by an extremely good and talented calligrapher designer color Carles Burgess, which has been working with us the last 35 years. Oh, wow. So we launch him when we get the script and we say, hey, we are going to need the title for each character and the production title. And he's been doing so many production titles, even for live action. He did some inspirational titles for Gladiator too. Prince of Egypt, El Dorado, Spirit, Heaven. Have any of them been used for like either the yeah. actual title of the movie or yes, Cruiser? Yes. Yeah, many. Cors Bride. Uh, they, he helped it on El Dorado and Prince of Egypt. He helped it on Ants. He helped it on, on Simbat and Shark Tale. He helped it with the departments with marketing and consumer products at DreamWorks for many years. Yeah, many so of them. If they do use it, do you get paid extra, or that's that's part of the bonus of working with Carlos? It's, we're going to do it anyway. Some studios, they pay an extra because they thought it was fantastic. Can, can he do the credits, the production credits, the main credits, as he did on Course Right, the starting main credits, and he did it too. Of course, was paid extra. But if the studio is using something that we have created for them, and it's included on the price. On the, f we do a quotation. We don't mind. It's paid. Right. It's right. it's better to use it than they do something else that doesn't work. You know. Sometimes the studio uses the inspiration to do something similar. Sometimes they went straight from his design, the title, the logo, and sometimes they just they did something different. Hey, we're gonna be happy anyway. We're more happy when they use it because it's done it. It's done already. And then on top of that, many artists, friends of mine, use it too, saying, hey, we have something, let's use it because it's this, this is the show we're presenting. And, and the three amigos, they use it sometimes. And, and, and it's, it's, it just, it's, it makes better uh, my designs. It looks better. If you, for example, if I create a character out there like these dolls, and then the logo is not at the level of the drawing, it's not gonna help. But if the logo is better than the drawings or the designs, or is at the level, it's gonna enhance, it's gonna make it more beautiful and impressive. And believe me, directors and producers did they enjoy it much this, you know. They were not expecting that. That's an extra, you know. That's, you know, it, like I ask this because um, we also do that. I didn't know that you did this until I saw it. Um, but, yeah, we also do this at our studio. And it's never become the actual text for the, the film, but we've had it become, like, crew shirts and things like that. Um, yeah. Kay, Kay Asadera, she started doing that in one of her films, that she was working on and we just continued it. It's just fascinating how 
we look completely different. We're from completely two different places, but I'm connecting with so many of the things that you've said or that you've done. Uh, it's, it's very interesting to me. You've worked on a lot of films, and I know when you work on a lot of films, there's a lot of films that we don't even know about that, that didn't come out. What film um, that you worked on that never came out would you have loved to see come out? Yeah. So, this one? Yeah. Oh. Uh, from every 10 movies, four. Sorry? Oh, no, I was just saying, like, oh, it's this one. This is the movie that you would love to see come out. <laughs> this is a short film that actually one of the best animators, stop motion animators um, in Laika. Is, is his own idea of doing a short film. And uh, um, unfortunately, he's so busy at Laika. He were, it has been for the last 12, 15 years there that he had no time to go further with. But he's still there. So it's his idea. Oh. Phil Dale. Um, he worked on Cars Right. We met, we met at uh, the Perry with Maker, that very short film that you show some images. And he asked me about, hey, Carlos, I would be very pleased if you could do some designs for this short film that I have in mind. That, uh, and this is another short film for an English fella, too. And uh, you know what happened with short films that they take so long to be made because it's, it's totally independent and it's one or two artists working alone in his studio. So they didn't came out any of those, but I have the the rights and respect for, for to show it in your, <laughs> in your interview and on the website too, because, yeah. But yeah, it's true that from, from every 10 movies we work, feature film or short films, only seven will see the light, you know? So three movies, from every 10 movies, three movies got canceled and got canned, you know? Many of them that we were for, for a long time at DreamWorks, you many like Tasker, uh, Boo, um, Me and My Shadow, um, Monkeys of Mumbai, uh, Zodiac, many great productions that they were looking terrific, you know, visually, you know, got canceled for script problems, you know. So, and what you were saying about that, that we do things similar, it's about common artistic sense not common sense, it's comic, common artistic sense. Artists, generally, they have common sense, so, so we apply to a nice piece, putting everything nice and presentable, you know? You don't want to see things done quickly and badly and not looking good enough, you know? Or as good as we can, you know? Because I was talking to some people the other day and many people want to get in the business. And, and I said, it's it's... It's not enough being good enough. You have to be just a rock star. I mean, you have to be impressing everyone from day one. Like you have to come in and clean the house. You have to be Michael Jordan compared to NBA basketball players, or you have to be Michael Phelps, you know, swimming. You have to be really, you know, impressing people, cleaning the house first day. It's true. Because when you when you see all these great guys that I mentioned, they're out there and they're still young. You know, they're they're gonna be there for the fifth for at least 10, 15, 20 years, I hope, I presume. And they're gonna be even better, you know. So to be able to go and play with them, you know, that's the NBA. You're not playing here at university basketball. You're playing with LeBron James and all these guys. I mean, from day one. So uh, it's, it's the reality, Bobby. I mean, I mean, you are a skilled artist, and and you see how great those those big guys are, you know. So <laughs> it's like, uh, so you better do your do you do your homework. I say, you know, it, you better stay working hard, thinking hard, playing hard, and enjoying hard. Then, but but working hard, really, but uh, working your nine to fourteen hours a day if you can. If you could take your kids back to any point in your artistic career, it could be in the very beginning, 
It could be at the height, at some award show, whatever it might be. What part, what, you know, you couldn't change anything. You just let them see, kind of like in a glass bubble. Daddy, back then, at any point, where would you want to take them? Can you describe that moment? I wish I could start earlier in animation. That will be my, my regret, you know? I wish I could start, because I, I started 10 years earlier doing comic strips for Disney publishers and German publishers and publishers in, in the Netherlands and publishers in France and in Spain. And I love it, animation from the day one. The moment I had the Illusion of Life book, I said, wow, this is fantastic. It's, I just don't want, I don't really want to animate, but I want to create these beautiful images, you know? If I could go back and I would go to my, after I finished my school, I didn't study art school. I went later to study art techniques in animation, but much later when I was an actor, already working on comic strips at night. I was going to the school to learn, to learn animation techniques. But if I could, I will start at 18 in animation, not at 24 or 20, whatever, 25 or 23, I don't know, you know. If I could even start at 16, I will, but my mom and dad wanted me to finish the, stu the studies first, you know, to the first, I wanted to be a, become an, an, an archaeologist, you know, but I really loved it to draw. And my family were very encouraging me and Jordi to draw and have the, our own studio from the early days, working for um, comic strips and publishers in a small scale. But, but, but they were very good at that. So they helped me a lot on that, you know. So, so that was good. But... If I could to work, if I, if I was born in the U.S., I would have rather went to Cal Arts or start a Disney studio at 17 or 18 years old, if they would hire me, of course. But uh, that would be my dream, you know. But, hey, I sleep well. I don't regret. But, but you are asking me, so I'm telling you. Oh, no, I... My yeah, I was I was more saying like um, if we could go into a time machine and see any part of your life not change anything, you know, if you yeah. could take your kids to any part in your life just to see and not change anything, then where would you, where would we go? I would go to my first trip to England in London and starting on We Are Back in Balto and developing cats with Nicola Marley. That never happened the way we wanted to see it. And I will go to 1995, DreamWorks Pictures, at the beginning, everything starting. Those are the two great moments, I will repeat, because the, the energy and everything happening at that time with a new company, you know, that, that was something that I don't think I'm going to repeat in my life. Well, shoot, like uh, seeing Steven Spielberg walking down the hall. Did you ever see Sp Steven Spielberg walk down the hall in DreamWorks? We saw Spielberg in London, too. He was coming once or twice a year, but we saw him, so we knew him from there. Wow. And the fact that Spielberg, Spielberg knows his designers, so he knows me and he knows Nico and he knows Christoph Serran as an animator. Spielberg has a good memory, so he knows us. So he sees, if he sees we're going to have a chat. So, and, and Katzenberg, of course, because uh, Stephen was important, but then the leading guy in animation was Jeffrey. So, so yeah, of course. Yeah, we will talk and we will laugh about those years, but in a good way, because uh, we have to be grateful. They gave us the great opportunity to work for them. Yeah. And for good part, not every movie was a success. Not every movie was looking amazing. Even having the best assets to, to look amazing. But we have to be grateful. Those companies gave us the opportunity, you know. You know how many students are waiting for the first opportunity to work with anyone? 
when many people like me or, or the ones that they are working there, we work with Spielberg, Barton, Del Toro, or Ridley Scott, or many, many, we met those directors and we talked to them and, and we, we interact for good or bad. Good experience, very good experience, bad experience, so-so experience, but we had the opportunity, you know? You know how many people are trying now to get into this business and just looking for the first experience with someone, whoever is the director? I always say the same. I work with 42 directors. No matter the name, there is always something good to learn about any of those directors. There is something good to learn always about the person that is directing you, even if all the team thinks is the worst director in the planet. But, but there is always something to learn about someone directing you, you know? Because even the ones that they they ask me to repeat and repeat many times my designs, we end up with a better design. It's so we kind of end up on probably less fresh, but we end up with with a good design out there, you know. I love this. I've been learning so much from this interview. Uh, I thank you for that. And uh, I have just one last question that I'd like to ask you, Carlos, if that's all right. No, I just shut up. I just, yeah. Uh, yeah, please. If you could go back into your past and thank somebody from your past, somebody that did something special for you or taught you something that was really special. I know Jordy is at the top of the list, but um, who would that person be? They don't have to necessarily be um, the most obvious Something interesting. Yeah, it and will I, be my 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 dad and mom. It will be my because I have to tell you a story. I was very young. I was sixteen years old, and uh, I I had to finish my school and uh, starting at university and finishing with a dean in Spain at that time. And my mom took my designs and took me, and it went to a studio and knock at the door here in Barcelona, a studio, a comic strip studio, and said, I want to talk to the boss. And they said, well, we are very busy, and you know, lady, you, you didn't even call. You just came. Yeah, this is my son. I need to talk to the boss. And we went in, and the boss was kind enough to give us five minutes, and my mom said, I just want to know if you could help me, please. If my son has a capacity of becoming any good on what he does. And he, she showed my early comic strips. And the boss said, yes. And he will be at least good enough, you know? And, and, and then we left and my mom said, well, in two years we will come and knock at the door again for a job. And in fact, she did it. <laughs> and that was my first job in a studio and obviously I have to thank my mom wow that's a great so one I, I never really applied for a job <laughs> she applied for a job so that's fantastic well I want to thank you Carlos again for your wonderful thoughts your stories uh, this has been not just entertaining but very educational for me and I'm sure for everybody make sure everybody to Go to Carlos's amazing new website. I'm sure it's already up. You can go into details and click on it. Thank you so much, Carlos. Thank you for your interest and giving me the opportunity, boy. All the best. Bye. Okay, I try to do my best. And their journey to being becoming an artist. Well, that's tricky because uh, every member 
Every family is different. My family, they have been very supportive. But the thing is that the member who wants to become an artist has to be really passionate about it and explain it to them, you know. And it's gonna take it's gonna take at least five, six years to to ramp up to, to get a great portfolio or decent portfolio and and go out there for, for a job. But uh, they just have to explain the passion and this is what they wanna do and, and be and be tough about it. I mean they have to pursue their dreams, you know. Um, next question we have here is, can you talk a little bit about the very beginning of your process when you get a new character to design and develop? Okay, great. They are hearing my voice, correct? Yep. Very good. Um, that's always tricky, but I always start the same way. I take um, a week... Uh, a week or a week and a half thinking about it. That's why I don't take jobs for two weeks, you know. <laughs> so that's that's non-paid. That's non-paid work, you know, that I always try to schedule things ahead where I know before starting, at least two weeks before, what I'm I'm gonna be working. And and I take a lot of time thinking about it and adding reference pictures that I like or taking shots myself with my cell or mobile phone uh, of things that that I think are important for that character. Obviously, if there are animals or people that existed or they exist, I'm taking a lot of reference. I go to the zoo and a sketch. I'm not really very happy sketching in front of people but yeah i have my sketch little book which i uh, never saw and no mm -hmm. one saw it but uh and i'm not gonna publish it <laughs> but i try to i try if there are animals on the case of very early days of madagascar um i went to the zoo and i went to the zoo and i find i found the four main guys there and uh, I sketch for hours on a spirit too. I sketch on a spirit for at least two months horses because I had no idea how to do horses, to tell mm -hmm. you the truth. And uh, I need that ramp up myself of one week and a half, two weeks before starting a project. Obviously, yes, I did start projects without any ramp up. There were projects that they came right away and they said, we need your help. We have a little fire here and and I had to do it, but my best scenario, my idealistic plan is is one, two weeks of feeding myself and and decompressing from the previous job. That's very important. I think there are two things that they are very important on artists, and and I always say the same to rest well, mm -hmm. try not to have any addictions. If you want to have coffee, that's fine. No cold. It's okay. Um, that works for normal people to know mm. addiction, you know, and rest well, sleep well, try to have a life in balance, eat well, be rested because to be creative, you have to really be smart, sharp, energetic. And, and that is very important to me, you know, that, mm -hmm. that is important. And then second important thing is, be passionate about it. Give you 100%. Don't count the hours that you work on it. A, a great piece will take you from zero to 3,000 hours. So don't count if you put eight hours and they're going to pay you six. Um, be, I will say be faithful to the piece. What, whatever the piece, the piece, the art, the, the design needs, Give it to him, you know, give it to it. I mean, um, spend as much time as you can. And and the piece, the design will talk to you. It's going to tell you what it needs. That's great advice. Yeah. Awesome. Um, next question is, what is your research and creative process for designing characters or scenes 
set in regions, okay. cultures that you're not familiar with? Wow, that's, that's, that's it's even harder for me. Hmm. So when we were doing El Dorado in, and it's, it's, it's not Spain, Spain is Spain and El Dorado is Central America, you right. know? Um, when we were doing Spirit, Stallion, uh, when we were doing The Prince of Egypt, uh, I can name many, uh, but the process is just those two weeks going to museums, and finding people from that country, getting pictures, finding documentaries, getting books, getting tapes, um, as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And and then there is always something that it's it's very important. Don't try and, don't try to reinvent any art from any country. Egyptian art has is six thousand years old, so don't try to to reinvent it. Mm -hmm. You just have to be faithful. You just have to reproduce it as as best as you can. You know, mm -hmm. don't try to reinvent pre-Columbian culture. You know. Yeah, it's uh, don't try to reinvent um, Americana, Western culture, you know, on spirit stallion. Don't try on El Dorado on the on the side, the Spanish side of it. Of course, I knew a lot, but I had to go and and go to the libraries and 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 get information because that happened five hundred years ago, you know. So <laughs> yeah, but I had to I had to study close how those guys were living and how they the clothing were and, and everything. So yes, reference is vital. I would say working two years on a show or three years on a show, reference is going to be vital for the entire show, but very vital for the first six months. Mm -hmm. Without good reference, you will have a lack of knowledge of that culture. Um, we're going to be doing just a Hollywood take that will have nothing to do with that. Um, and then we will have not, no respect for that culture, which we are gonna be hurting a lot of people from that culture. If you mm -hmm. do something that resembles, that that is based on that culture, they will see the effort. Right. You know? Oh, that's great. Um, we have another question that's asking, how do you navigate or balance friendships versus professional relationships? Well, I have um, good friends. I have some, uh, many, I have many colleagues and many friends. I just, I, I, I'm, I'm really honest when I work with someone, they know I'm, I'm not gonna be playing under the table. Right. You know, on top of that, bear in mind that I am an artist is working from Spain. Mm -hmm. the majority of the time. So I don't want any power in a studio. I don't have my, yes, I have an office on some studios, but I don't want a bigger seat. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not playing on the big meetings with the big guys. I'm not calling directors. I'm not calling producers. I'm here doing my job. Right. So, so, so funny enough, I just want to do my part of the cake and do it well for the rest of the gang. I'm I'm not taking over anyone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Even no, even at being a head of department sometimes, or or the design designer leading on on that show, you know, I'm I'm giving the freedom to anyone. People they may be working in San Francisco or LA or London. You know, I'm I'm not on on top of them. I just ask them to to do the the more than one hundred percent on it on it. You know, so. So truly, I had been asked this question several times, kind of, are you kind of controlling the rest? Um, how do you work with the, hey, it's it's just, uh, I wouldn't even say fair competition. I do, I do what I do and I value my best colleagues and the ones that I learned so much and I keep learning every day. And, but I, I don't really compete. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, to do the best for that show, the best style possible for that show. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be pleasing the director every day. Right. I'm actually pissing off directors many times <laughs> because I, the way I see it, 
I'm doing the best for the show. Right. I'm just doing the best for that script. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing the best for that company. Mm -hmm. Do you find it's hard that like you're in Spain working with other people who aren't in Spain as well? Mm, not really because everyone is very professional mm -hmm. and I live in London and I live in LA and my life during the last 25 years, it's been very connected with LA back and forth all the time. I used to spend four or five months in LA per year. Okay. Now we COVID-19 is much less. I yeah. lived there for three, four years full time. And after that, I went there back and forth many times, six, seven times a year, mm -hmm. lately three, four. Um, no, because I never, I never was a, a power taker and I never wanted to sit on the same studio. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, by all means, um, the reason of opening our own company here is because we were born here and we have the studio 10 minutes walk from home. And, and the second of it is a, is a family business with my brother Jordi mm -hmm. uh, for the last 35 years. And, and third is that we want to be free to create in an environment that can be outside the big studio. Mm -hmm that it doesn't get polluted with the politics and with any kind of, um, we have the compromise with the job and, and the artistic quality. That's it, that's period. Totally. That's it. The compromise has to be with, with, with the job, mm -hmm. with giving a best creative job possible and, and change the style as much as you can because every script is different and no matter what, is going to need a degree of of mutating somehow yeah. to survive. Awesome. Um, next question is from Gabriella. She asks, who were your biggest influences when you were starting out? Well, it's funny because I'm coming from the comic strip planet. Mm -hmm. So so there were more comic strip, French and Spanish comic strips. Uh, from creators from Uderzo who created Asterix or American guys, Frank Fraxetta or Rick Kirby, um, um, many N.C. Wyeth illustrators, Howard Pyle, uh, Arthur Rackham, English illustrator, uh, Edmund Dulac, French illustrator who lived in, in England beginning of century. Um, many more later, but mostly painters and sculptures. Mm -hmm. Just from Rembrandt, Bugatti to, yeah. to of course Michelangelo, Rodin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But or 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 painters like Gustav Klimt or Egon Schiele, um, Toulouse Lautrec, uh, many many more. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's more fine art, what I like, and I always like it. So it's my I have a big thing that I have to visit a museum each month, minimum one. It used to be four a month. Wow. Also <laughs> four days or Sundays. Yeah, but now it's one. Mm -hmm. Just with COVID-19, since COVID-19 started, is one and when they are open. But all fine art, small, mediums, big museums, mm -hmm. small, exhibits, big exhibits. What's your That's favorite? It. Find my, inspira my best inspiration comes from nature and art, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's As that? I said, thank you. Yeah. yeah. What's your favorite museum that you've been to then, or would recommend? I would re I recommend a few, but Museo d'Orsay is one of my favorites in Paris. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, next one is from Amanda. She asks, What is the weirdest place you have found inspiration for one of your characters? Well, cemeteries, you know. Oh. <laughs> On Course Bright, I had to visit lots of uh, weird places, mm -hmm. mostly in London, where in London you have a, in the center of London, you may have a house and a cemetery on the back, you know, right. and you have the, all the graves and all that green, humid, damp stuff there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember, uh, yeah, Tim, Tim lives in London, Tim Burton, and I used to live there, and I think he still does. And I lived in London for five years too. And it was great to, it was great. I mean, it was, 
inspirational cemeteries and, and, and at the same time, the quietness of, of them, you yeah. know. So that's the weirdest place I had to be, you know. Then lots of trips to nature from Yosemite to to any national park, anywhere. Um, lots of underwater experience to go work on Shark Tale and other fishy movies. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I tried to get into anything that, uh, hey, that, that movie's underwater, so I'm going to do a scuba. So, yeah, I'm a bit crazy about that. That's awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm very meticulous on mm-hmm. on getting the real McCoy all the time. Yeah? Right. You know, if, if I can have the experience, it's, it's, I have to be on the spot, you know. Oh, that's great. Um, next question is from Marina. She asks, okay. what do you think is essential to have in a character design portfolio? Um, is there something that should stand out or call attention? Yeah. Um, I always recommend six, seven things that they should be there. Um, listen, um, I think I say it on the interview, but it, it, this is true. Lately, I'm realizing that there are so many good artists out there, mm-hmm. young people, um, showing their work everywhere from Instagram, portfolios, websites, etc. That being good enough, it's not, it's not going to guarantee a job. Right. You know, it's, it's really hard. Um, it may, it may sound weird, but if I would be starting nowadays, probably I wouldn't have the possibilities I had when I started 35 years ago, where mm. there were a few character designers. The majority of character design were done by the animators, the supervising animators. And, and there were not many designers specialized only on character design. Now we have so many. Yeah. Yeah, going back to the portfolio and her question, I will advise her, first of all, um, to have diversity of things and diversity of styles somehow and diversity of subjects. I mean, she may do well science fiction, but then it's better that at the same time she has creatures and animals and humans. So diversity. And probably she does well middle ages, uh, middle age time, but it's great that she goes contemporary on, on the human's dress or on that contemporary style. Um, and touches historical Roman time or let's say um, superheroes. Why? Because the studios, they're always looking for someone that has done something similar to what they have in mind for the next movie. Mm, okay. So when they check portfolios, they say, oh, great, you do great hippos or rhinos. Oh, we have a movie about a rhino coming. Great. Mm-hmm. So. Many of the recruiters, they're just looking for that image that will influence the movie. So if you had done that subject on your portfolio, it may stick out and you may get the job just because you touched that, you did it and you have it in your portfolio. And then another thing that I really recommend these days is a good portfolio should have a great um, development of inspirational sketches of one character, then a good turnaround of the same character, great facial expressions of that character, body attitudes of that Mm -hmm. character, and a lineup with that character and the colleagues or neighbors or Mm -hmm. friends of that character on the movie. Why? Because if you show that potential, you are becoming an asset for the studio because you are developing the, the entire model. You are thinking as a team worker, you are giving so much information to the modelers, to the animators. And then it's great that you control line, you control color, so you can do your character in color in with a great line. Um, 
your sketches, they have to be really, I wouldn't say clean, they can be rough, but they they have to be very strong. Mm -hmm. They have to be very, very strong in design. Uh, if you draw a hand, it's important that it's well done. If you if you draw a shoe, a feet, a foot, whatever, it's important that it's very well done. And pay attention to any small detail. Presentation is everything. So go to the battle with your best guns. Prepare a nice logo for that character. Put your own copyright if it's yours. Protect yourself somehow. Mm -hmm. um, do a piece in color as best as you can. Um, make that character lovable. I wouldn't say cute, but appealing for okay. sure. You know, that is very important. So all these things in a portfolio, which a great portfolio shouldn't have more than 25 images because a recruiting departments, they don't have that much time to mm -hmm. go on. They're checking, for example, every day between 20 and 50 portfolios from all around the planet. So they have. it has to be really good. And it has to be a specific, it has to be, it has to be short, good, short, but really pleasant to look at and very appealing on what you show. Show your best pieces. Don't, please do not put everything there. I'm very tough with myself on that. Even when I am presenting, my 60% of the job goes on the bin each day. Right. So, so be very critical, you self critique you just put the very best. And if you have questions, ask people around. I have, I'm in a studio. I show my work to people. I am really open to, to critiques. And if more than one says, hey, that's not good, um, I'm not showing that piece. Mm. If one says that's not good, I'm thinking about it and I am repeating that piece. Wow. Because if, if a good friend of yours, a person that you trust is saying, Mm, there is something there that that is not one hundred percent. I'm not one hundred percent sure. It it happens. Many yeah. people are gonna make the same mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is great advice, Carlos. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Um, next question is from Landon. He asks, um, "Have you ever considered exploring other areas of animation outside of character design, like storyboarding?" Yeah, I, I did storyboarding on Balto, my, one of my first films. And I did storyboarding at DreamWorks on a movie or two because it was a gap and they needed some, some animatics to get done and the storyboard getting done. I like storyboarding a lot. And yes, I like it. The only problem that this planet had became an animation planet and feature film had became so mm -hmm. specialized yeah that it's it's really difficult to get out of your cage and invade other cages you know yeah. um at the same time normally i'm very short on time but yeah um i would love to do even yeah i did actually props i did backgrounds stylizing same way that i am stylizing characters i can stylize backgrounds and work with production designers or art directors in color. But mostly I get a lot of commitments on character design and, and really short on time on other things. But yeah, I would love to explore other things. The, the problem is time. Yeah. Awesome. Um, next one is, are there any books that you would recommend for artists and, or podcasts you know are must listen for artists? Well, artists that they want to be in animation, they all must have the illusion of life from Disney. Mm. That's yeah. a good one. That's a great one. Yeah. Then I uh, have been doing all these great books. Uh, one of my colleagues, a writer, Charles Solomon, has been writing a lot about animation. All his books are, are lovely. Uh, there is one on Sleeping Beauty, which I love that movie. Um, then I recommend a book that came out a few years ago about Rembrandt Bugatti, the sculpture. It's a French book. It's an amazing book. Uh, Bugatti is a guy that 
He was extremely talented, but he died very young. I don't know if at 24 or 26, but he was one of the best sculptures I ever seen. And images of his work and his animals are, are amazing. So I recommend that book too. And, and obviously I recommend to check all the New Yorkers covers and art yeah. from Carl Goodrich, you know, and Pete Desef. Yeah. Some of two of my Too best great. fellas, you know, and friends, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah, their work is great. Mm. Um, next question is um how to study or how do you study and practice character design daily and efficiently? It's, it's, this is the problem, it's your time to study. It's 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 jumping on it, you know. Um the thing is that when you get the commitment, there is not much time around. Um, there isn't the perfect job that they call you one year in advance and tells you, hey, you're mm -hmm. going to design this, you know, and then you can prepare yourself. The job's mm -hmm. commitment, probably they are, the call comes on, on Friday last, in, at the end of the afternoon or in the evening or an email asking if I have a window or the studio can do that job. And then on Monday, we are talking with directors. Right. So, and then on Monday, they want us to start and they want to see, they want to see things on Wednesday or Friday. So starting on a job is always tricky. That's why I ask uh, my two weeks ramp up or one and a, one and a half week ramp up in order to, to be a sponge and starting to, but then obviously I heard about the panic of the white paper or the syndic, you know, <laughs> the computer in a blank piece of nothing, a white screen and starting to sketch. You have to, I had no panic on that. You have to, you have to jump right away without any net, you know, that's, that's, that's the best thing on all time, all time circus, no net, you know, you, you have to, I recommend not to think much about it and get, if you think much about it, you get the panic on you, you know, you get scared to start sketching. Mm -hmm. No, no, no panic. Jump right away and sketch for 10 hours and sketch again the next day for 10, 12 hours. And the following day, 12, 14 hours. And then after four days, put everything on the floor or pin everything on a big wall. And in three, four days, you, your brain is going to be refreshed and you're going to have better perspective and you're going to see what is sticking out or not. And then follow the, follow the leader. So, so follow what sticks out. Why? Be analytical. Why that? That sketch is telling you something and is telling people something. And, and that is gonna that is gonna be speaking to you and, and follow that thing, you know, and discover more things on that on that line, on that style, and and create something new and build a new alphabet, what I'm saying, A, B, and C. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and start and start and and push the envelope. Get out from your comfort zone. I don't like to live on my comfort zone. I'm saying no to many projects because they are not the projects I want to do. But right now I'm, I'm just basically basically working on the projects I want to do, and and they're not the easy ones to me. Yeah. They're not my style. They're not the easy ones. But I want to be out from the comfort zone. As soon as you get relaxed, and 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 working on your comfort zone. I seen so many great artists that they got in the studios for 30, 40 years on the comfort zone and they didn't improve much. And I saw other guys that, yes, they stood in the studios, but they did freelancing and they did their own jobs and they did their own illustrators, illustrations and they did their own scoping. And those guys had rocket year, they had run. They, they did great and they did so many things and, and things that I couldn't believe and I never 
imagine that they could do that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's explore, be out there, be curious, and explore anything that is out from your comfort zone. It's gonna make you richer, it's gonna make you better. Yeah. I'm saying richer artistically, you know, not economically, but but yeah, economically you're gonna get more jobs because it makes you better artists and obviously you have more exposure and they're gonna be the ring is the, the phone is gonna be ringing. But the thing is that what is important first is to be pushing boundaries, you know, discovering new paths, exploring, you know, and and creating a blueprint every time you do something. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, next question is from Sylvia. She asks, what things should be avoided to achieve good character design? It should be avoided to copy too much other people. I had yeah. I, I had great inspirational from my best friends and people that I admire for years. But somehow you have to add something. You have to, and don't be a stock for, for many years doing the same, well, at least the same cliche character. Mm -hmm. Reminds that movie, you know. If I would be creating things close to Carlos Bride, mm, that's it. It was done. It was great experience of working with him. My all the people I work here in Spain, the the people in London, the puppet makers and McKinnon and Saunders, Mike Johnson, the other second director. Um, that was great, but it was it's done. Let's go and explore something else, you know. You have always to be don't don't become repetitive, even if that was a success that you created that thing. That's why I don't work on sequels. I don't yeah. work on second, third, fourth parts. Um, they don't say anything to me. I have no interest, basically. Yeah. Perhaps one day is going to come a sequel that they say, hey, we want to do something different. Could you create 500 new characters and we're going to be changing the style and those guys are going to be growing up and they're going to be much different. But um, right now, I don't have the interest. I'm, I'm not doing anything if I don't have the interest. It's not about the money that they are paying. It's not about the studio that is offering the job. It's it's about, I'm, my first question is, Obviously, when you start, you have to take any jobs. I understand. Yeah. I'm not in that position. So obviously, I understand all of you who are you are starting preparing portfolios, eager to get the best, the first jobs. Go for it. Anything that comes, try to do your best. But to me, right now, and it's been for the last ten years for sure. It's my my main question is. Do I want to create that thing? Do I? I am going to enjoy tomorrow and the day after tomorrow and the next two years or the next six months working on it. Mm -hmm. And and if the question is no, I don't want to hear about how much they are paying. Right. I'm not interested. You know. I don't want to be feeling miserable for two years or six months or even six days. Exactly. You know, it's like. All these people that they are complaining because they are working on a job that they don't like. Oh, I'm I'm working on the bank and I hate it. So hey, quit. Right. It's, it's not making any good to you and your health. You know. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, next question is: Do you um, do you also have personal projects besides your job in feature films? Yes. <laughs> I have been ripped off twice with good friends of mine on pitching and then after three, four years coming something really close, extremely mm -hmm. similar. So I got scared with my other colleagues. Um, this is true. Oh no. Uh, I've been ripped off twice with great projects that they have been successful oh, no. and I can prove that and I have friends that that working on it and, and powerful friends in in in, in the business. But we couldn't, we couldn't pro prove it. If you don't find the smoking gun, it's really difficult. Then at the same time, we were very naive those mm -hmm. days. 
uh, we didn't protect ourselves well when we went and pitching. So that's very common in Hollywood, and you must have heard lots of stories. So I tell you that two happened to me in 35 years. So yes, I have my own projects. Um, I have even some illustrations on my own, but um, so perfectionist and never ready to show anything. So <laughs> on that side, yes, I have them, but um, but it's it's they are on the back burner. They are there or on the fridge. Some of them, yeah. And <laughs> and I work and I say, well, when I retire, I will give it a a push, you know. But no, I don't see any possibilities right now. On, on, on these things happening. But yes, there are my own stories, um, my own designs, my own style. But um, I don't really have the stamina or I don't feel energetic now I'm going and pitching my own stories, you know. Um, yeah. There is a lot of uh, crocs out there. Mm -hmm. And even whoever you are, even if you are a name on the business, they're going to change the subject. It's the same story, but they're going to change the time period, whatever. And I just suffer two times. And if I do it one day, it's going to be probably I recommend to illustrate a book. That's the story. Get it out, publish it or edit it yourself or make a short film. And then it's going to be difficult that they are going to rip you off mm -hmm. after so and and use that thing to go and selling, you know. Yeah. The project. Wow. But uh, get get something published first, or make a short film about it, you know, and then go and 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 try to pitch it as a big story, you know, as a feature film mm -hmm. or TV series. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Um, last few questions here. Um, for getting into pre-production. Which software should we be well-versed in? Software. Well, you have to be working on Photoshop, if, if they refer to that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's great nowadays that designers, they do the design on Photoshop or they work on different kind of programs, but they also, they, they know about ZBrush for scoping or Maya. You know, yes. those two things are, are vital right nowadays because you can model. So you, the studio can relay more on you, which you can. I work on traditional techniques mostly. My brother is very good on, on computer and scoping too. But, um, but yeah, I will recommend if people are, are for it to, to really learn ZBrush and, and then obviously Photoshop um and then i recommend to to have a knowledge of traditional techniques because even if it's hard to believe nowadays there is a lot of people 30 40 percent that they still work on traditional techniques with pencils and markers and you know and and watercolors and it's beautiful so so the more you know the better the better for sure yeah um, okay, next question. How would you approach drawing poses and emotions for the character that already has the design resolved for you? Okay. The most important thing is that to think that you are creating for that film and you are creating a character and you have to know a lot about that character. Who's going to give you the information? The director and the studio. First of all, this is going to be a script that you have to read and take your notes. And then you are going to ask for a meeting with the director. And it's going to happen because we are on, on a small core and a small team when every project starts. Mm -hmm. And the great things about character designers and they have a connection with the director and the right. producers of the show. On that great time of things starting, which is the most creative time of all, nothing exists and has to be created. And then you have to ask your director 
hey, I read the script, it's great, but I have some questions about this character. Could you please give me your take? And he's going to be talking for minutes and hours sometimes. So you are going to be taking notes, going back to the table or to the computer and creating under those premises and those notes, the character that you had already visualized it when you had been talking with the director. I have this, um, I visualize the characters when I'm talking with the director of what more or less I'm gonna draw or be drawing because he's telling me about that guy or that girl or that animal. And lots of images are coming to my mind and I try to retain the main ones and and I try to be faithful to everything he had said. Not only to please him, that's not the word. It's to impress him when mm -hmm. I present something to say, wow, that's that's the guy. And then something very important. Even if I believe that's the guy, you have to give options, as many options as you can. Don't treat directors like a stupid guy. Don't present one or two. You're going to get fired. Right. You have to present a bunch of options. Mm -hmm. And then they may be, you're going to find great directors and they're going to ask you, hey, what's your take? Which one do you like? And then you go and say whatever you think, which one you prefer. And But he's going to be picking. And usually it's not going to be picking yours, you know, so, <laughs> so, but, but the great thing is that you have to show variations and options, the more, the better. For example, working on any movie, I prepare between 10 and 20 variations per each character that I am presenting from day one. Then I keep exploring. If he doesn't like anything, I keep exploring. Uh, one of the most difficult characters we ever worked with, my friend Carter Goodrich, um, it was on Moses. We did more than 200 Moses on Prince of Egypt. Wow. Yeah, on the first six months of the show, starting on in LA, living and working 10 hours a day, um, we end up doing more than 200 different wow. Moses faces and bodies and until we got one that they kind of everyone like it and then we we kept sketching on that um, path and and that way of of that character and and but hey, you have there two two good designers and 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 they're working for six months on the same character that's wow. pretty unbelievable mm -hmm. you know? Well, Carlos, last question. Sure. Um, this is from Stephanie. She asks, how do you handle self-doubt when you're creating character designs and not sure about your vision? Um, it's very simple to say, forget about all the crap. I know it's very difficult yeah. because um, it's not that I am a very secure guy. It's not that I'm an insecure guy either. But, but listen, if you keep questioning yourself you're not going to move that's why i was telling stephanie you do you you do your best sketch sketch and sketch and don't be tired of sketching and things are going to happen probably not the first day probably not the first week but eventually things are going to happen and if we question every stroke that we do you know mm -hmm. can you imagine any artist from velazquez to to Gauguin, uh, Van Gogh, Picasso, questioning himself every stroke or every painting or any anything, any sketch yeah. he has done. For sure, at the very end, they will question, you know, which one is best and they will, they will have a talk with the piece. This is what I'm saying. But if we are to scare, we're going to have big problems. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be proceeding on this. We have to jump on the piece. We have to think about the piece. It has to be sometimes even an obsession. Being an artist sometimes is an obsession of, of how to resolve the thing, but you have to do it. You have to jump on it. You have to, to really work hard on it and, and things are gonna happen. If, if we don't jump on it, 
we're gonna have panic to that scenario, you know, to mm -hmm. to confront that thing, and that's not gonna be good, you know. So, so forget it about jumping into the white paper. The sooner the better, mm -hmm. with no question, you know. You know, jump on it. The sooner the better. Don't even have a nap. Um, I mean, <laughs> finish your lunch and jump on it. Take a coffee if you like, or or just a lemonade, whatever, soft drink, water, but jump on it. Because when you jump on it, things are starting to happen. And this is the only way of resolving those issues and and putting your 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 weaknesses on your back, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's very important, you know? You have to really, you have to really, I wouldn't say fight, you have to succeed, but you will only succeed if you jump on it and work on it hard, as much hard as you can. No, that was fantastic, Carlos. Thank you so much for joining us today and all of your amazing words. There's so many amazing comments just saying like, what an honor it is to have you speak to us today, that you're the guide of our entire generation. So thank you so much. It was great thank chatting you. with you today. Uh, let me say one thing. Of course. Thank you to, thank you to of course, um, Lightbox Expo for inviting me, but thank you to anyone who had lost his time, you know, Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hope it's not really lost it, but thank you to to all of you and everyone who put a question or everyone who put a well thought there or write wrote something really cool. Um, having an interest on me and my art. That's it. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Rose. Everyone loves your art. Everyone is so amazed by it. So thank you for joining us today. It was amazing. Take care, and all thanks, of you. Everyone for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Thank you.